Let's have a closer look at common security misconceptions. What I hear often is that my enterprise needs to be very concerned about zero days. Zero days are exploits just discovered for which there is no patch available. Andrew, can you provide us some more details around these common misconceptions? Sure. Actually, they shouldn't be very concerned overall. The reality is most companies are compromised by old and unpatched vulnerabilities in software running on top of Windows or on top of any operating system. So from a recent InfoWorld article, uh, it stated Microsoft Security Intelligence Report lists the most popular exploits. And most successful exploits are old. Another quote from that same article says, the Verizon data breach report of 2016 revealed that out of all detected exploits, most came from vulnerabilities dating to 2007. Next was 2011. Vulnerabilities dating back to 2003 still account for a large portion of hacks of Microsoft software, but not most. Now here's something that's interesting though. According to our latest security intelligence report, over the last six years, it's been observed that if Microsoft vulnerabilities are exploited at all, they are most likely to be exploited as zero-day exploits. So what should I do? What should our customers do? It seems like there's a contradiction in those findings, Andrew. So it does. But what it means for our customers is that you really need a stack that can protect you regardless of whether the vulnerability or exploit is known or unknown, public or not. So the first thing that a customer should do actually is patch their application layer, such as Flash, Java, Office, etc., aggressively, as this is actually how most organizations are compromised today. That's interesting, Andrew. A few years ago, this would have been after making sure operating system is patched, right? That's very true. Um, but one of the things that we've learned over the last six years, Microsoft has observed a big decrease in both the percentage and raw numbers of vulnerabilities for which someone builds an exploit within 30 days of the security update being made available. For example, in 2015, only 5% of Microsoft's remote code execution or elevation of privilege vulnerabilities had any evidence of being exploited within 30 days of a security patch being created. So unless, since less than 5% of the time, uh, a successful exploit is created within 30 days, after a patch is released, patching within 30 days is acceptable. So, but back to the operating system. And the previously mentioned zero days. What is our recommendation here? So this is where it's very important that our customers run the latest version of Windows and turn on the latest malware protection features that can stop both known and unknown malware. That's why you have to have that kind of stack. For example, um, this is because starting with Windows 10, Microsoft has partnered with our hardware vendors to really raise the bar about stopping malware. We enforce driver signing, we have what's called LSAS protections with Credential Guard. We have a hypervisor code integrity technology, um, also known as Device Guard, which is part of that. They all work together to protect our customers. So for example, there were two recent families of malware. One was called Promethium, the other one was called Neodymium. Both used a zero-day exploit that executed code to download a malicious payload. So the hacker can stay in the system. They are both stopped by these technologies on Windows 10 systems. So are you saying that if those compromised systems had been running Windows 10 and the mentioned feature enabled, they wouldn't have been compromised? Yes, that's absolutely right. So what's about customers running Windows 7 or Windows 8? Well, while those operating systems in their 64-bit versions do provide security features such as driver signing enforcement, they still lack those hardware-based, those hardware-backed features such as credential guard and device guard. So while one of the potential attack vectors would be stopped by the driver signing enforcement in Windows 7 and 8, 
several others wouldn't be. So again, how could Microsoft actually help our customers? Option one would be leverage the public guidance available for System Center, Config Manager, Intune, and Windows OS deployment on TechNet. Option two would be, or might be, if you suspect have been compromised, engage premier support, which can arrange for our on-site incident response team and tactical recovery team. To do so, contact our premier support team. What you should do before a security incident occurs in any case, we highly recommend you have a review at least at our public guides on TechNet responding to IT security incidents or work directly with your designated TAM, Technical Account Manager, or Microsoft Consulting Services support person. So Microsoft Enterprise Services has many consulting and premier offerings around an accelerated Windows operating system deployment, thereby getting you some of those protections as fast as possible, patch management with System Center Configuration Manager or Intune, and we also have cybersecurity services to harden your most critical assets. We also have a group called the Enterprise Threat Detection Service that helps detect attacks as they occur and help responders neutralize the threat as soon as possible. So moving on to the next example, when using system management and security software like antivirus, backup software, or my domain controller, does this improve my security? So not really. Um, and the caveat there is if those agents, which they often do, are running as system or administrator, and the administrators of those systems that have those agents are not properly protected. Why? Any system or user account that can manage a domain controller with that level of access is actually, even though you might not have intended it, the equivalent of an enterprise admin in Active Directory. Oh. Well, so to answer this, we need to dive a little deeper and discuss some secure key security concepts, such as the credential tier model and credential hygiene. Let's start with the credential tier model. The purpose of this model is to demonstrate that at all credentials in your customers' environments or accounts in your organization are of equal value. Let's start with tier zero. These are all domain admins and enterprise admins and domain controllers. Tier zero includes accounts, groups, and other assets that have direct or indirect administrator control over your Active Directory, Forest, domains, or domain controllers, and all of these assets in it. The security sensitivity of all tier zero assets is equivalent as they are all in control of each other. Example would be agents running on the system for this backup, monitor software, or antivirus. Next comes tier one. And tier one assets in a domain model are your member servers. They are your server OSs, your enterprise applications, um, also your, any of the server administrators of the tier one servers. And you have to remember that these accounts have access to a significant amount of business value that is actually hosted on them. So for example, these can be your SQL servers, your SharePoint servers, your file servers. This is where attackers go for the actual data. And last, we have tier two admins, controlling the user workstation and devices. Tier two admins accounts have administrative control of significant account of business value that is hosted on users' workstation and devices. Examples include help desk people and computer supporting administrative because they can import and uh, integrate of almost any user data. For most details around tiering, we provide technical articles on TechNet or enterprise services can help you to identify those assets. So with this model come some rules and it's very important that you follow them. So the first one is credentials from a higher privilege tier should never be exposed on a lower tier system. Lower tier credentials can use services provided by higher tiers, but not the other way around. And finally, any system or user account that can manage a higher tier is also a member of that tier, whether you intended to be or not. So Andrew, when those rules aren't followed, but have been seen happened to our customers? So as we mentioned earlier, attacks often start by gaining ground of a beachhead, some computer in your network, sometimes we call this internally as a patient zero, 
This is usually a phishing attack, but can also be done by compromising a website that your employees commonly use, or by delivering malware through advertising or some other means. But in the end, most attackers want to go from Tier 2 up to Tier 0 and gain control to all your identities. But that's really only a means to the end. Remember, your most important business data is stored at Tier 1. So it's just a means to the end to gain domain admin. But the next step, though, is for attackers to try to gather credentials on these workstations. And they're, of course, all been compromised, and including the local administrator uh, hashes, which allows them to move laterally between all those workstations until they find one being used by your domain administrators. Once they do that, they can directly elevate themselves to domain admin, and then they can start attacking your servers. So what this leads to is an attacker gaining full control of your environment, your entire business, and it's a shared state of control. So your own administrator is not really aware that there's someone sitting there co-administrating your network. And this attack is really difficult to detect um, with conventional means because attackers are using legitimate credentials. So Andrew, just to be clear, once a beachhead has been established on, on an average in a customer's environment, an attacker only needs 24 to 48 hours to gain control over the whole enterprise with domain admin credentials. And that's right, Frank. And even worse, it remains undetected on average for over five months. So Frank, what should or could our customers do to fix this? Step one, deploy a tier model based OU structure in your environment. Um, so we have recommendations for those things around how to do it, and we can help you doing those things. By deploying this in parallel in your current environment, you can move over easily and migrate the users as needed. That's right. It gives you a good fallback option. So step two is protect your administrator's credentials and isolate them by using dedicated workstations. We call them privileged access workstation, or PAWS for short aligned to each tier. Now we'll go in more details in a deep dive on, on the PAW in a little bit. But step three is, and this is very important, is to evaluate and trim as many agents from your domain controllers as possible. What this does is it reduces the often unintended scope and size of tier zero. Because again, as I mentioned, every one of those agents becomes tier zero. For software agents you still need on your domain controllers, such as antivirus, deploy a dedicated instance just for them and make sure anyone that administrates the antivirus system, for example, has a PAW. So Frank, can Microsoft help? Of course. As mentioned, leverage our public guidance at uh, aka MS CyberPAW about how to, how to do a PAW. And to just talk about and how to create, protect your admin workstations. Yep, so an option two is Microsoft Enterprise Services can help accelerate the adoption of, of PAWS. They can also help you identify and reduce upstream risk to Active Directory and implement this credential tier model in your organization with the following offerings. So we have one called Privilege Access Workstation. We also have a related one called the Enhanced Security Administrative Environment, which is essentially building a separate Active Directory for us to hold your administrator accounts and their admin workstations. We also have a offering for uh, identifying risk in your environment, um, such as the Active Directory Hardening Offering, ADH. Um, and we have a service called the Advanced Threat Analytics implementation service that help customers understand the threat detection and develop an incident response plan in advance for anything that's found using the advanced threat analytics. It also, of course, helps them deploy it in their environment. For our next example, Andrew, a lot of customers are implementing jump servers and multi-factor authentication to protect the administration. However, is this really protecting the administrators? So not really, and this is actually one of my favorites I like to talk to customers about. Um, if the system 
that you use to log in with multi-factor authentication to your jump servers is compromised, then you really haven't bought yourself anything. Why is this? So it's because an everyday workstation that has unrestricted internet access, email, your line of business applications, etc., is much more likely to be compromised because often these systems have not, or maybe they can't have because of the applications, many of the latest protections applied to them to prevent compromise. So also, another big factor here is that unless this workstation that the administrator uses was built from a clean operating system image based on what we call the clean source principle, it is at very high risk to have been compromised even at the moment of installation. And a lot, I read a lot about this clean source principles. Mm -hmm. Did we ever see such thing happen that existing workshop or service image got compromised by attackers? Yes, unfortunately we have. Um, this is why we recommend to our customers and our public guidance to do a separate build and have a totally separate build process for their administrative workstations. It's also why we provide our own automation server for deployment during our services engagements. Don't your operating system features like Credential Guard, Device Guard, and Defender ATP mitigate these threats? So while a Windows 10 system deployed, as we discussed earlier, with all the latest protection, really raises the bar immensely with all of these uh, protections and removing uh, restricted admin and things like this, Removing unrestricted internet access, email, and blocking all inbound traffic with a host-based firewall, they're really needed in addition to all of the above to fully mitigate the primary ways customers are compromised. And what about multi-factor authentication, like smart cards and Windows Halo for business? So this is a good question. Um, smart cards, Windows Hello for business, formerly known as Passport, and lots of other multi-factor authentication technologies are really designed for one purpose. And that is to ensure that you are in fact who you say you are and who you claim you are in as rigorous a way as possible. However, they're not really mitigations for credential theft or any sort of malware that might be able to impersonate you once you have logged in. So the main point is on an everyday workstation, with multi-factor authentication isn't suitable for administrators, even with the jump server. That's correct. That's right, Frank. Um, an attacker, even with multi-factor authentication, can ride the session and go all the way from their workstation to the jump server and then beyond to the intended system that they want to administrate. So we show a diagram of this on this slide where the attacker actually goes through this shared workstation where it's very common for our customers to have split administrator accounts and regular accounts. However, they still use the same unified workstation which puts them at risk. As you can see in the second scenario, using a properly built and secured PAW with all the hardening I mentioned and using clean source removes the attacker's ability to abuse this process. At least that's the goal. So the question again is, what should our customers do? As before, the first step is protect, isolate your administrator's credentials by using dedicated workstations. We call them privileged access workstations aligned to each tier. Because these administrator's systems are less dynamic and have less complexity, the next step should be to deploy and hardening features on this workstation that may not have been implemented, such as device guard, um, Halo or Credential Guard. You should also block inbound traffic, limit internet access to cloud management sites as needed and remove email access. What if a customer prefers to use jump servers as part of their established operating process? So the good news is customers don't need to eliminate their jump servers, okay? It's not a bad idea. It's just that you need to visit those jump servers from privileged access workstations, and then harden those jump servers in many of the same ways that you harden the paws. For example, limit access, internet access, uh, email access, line of business applications on jump servers that are being used for administration. Okay? 
Use Server 2016. We've got some great features there where you can turn on Credential Guard, Device Guard, etc. on the Jump Server just like you can on Windows 10. And then finally, from those clients, from those PAWS, you can use what's called Restricted Admin Mode, or we have a new feature in 2016 called Remote Credential Guard that helps to protect your administrative credentials while they're using the Jump Server. So again, the question, how can Microsoft help me here? So as before, we have the public guidance at AKEMS CyberPaw on how to create and protect your admin workstations. And we also have another link out there we didn't mention earlier, aka.ms slash clean source, which can go over more detail on how to really make sure these systems are protected from the moment they're imaged. But what about some of our services offerings? Oh, we have a couple of them. So Microsoft Enterprise Services can help to accelerate your adoption of PAWS to include implementation of both the secure features and automation of the clean source principles with the following offerings as already mentioned. We have the enhanced um, security administration environment, ESIE, privileged access workstation PAW, active director hardening, only to mention some of those offerings. For a final example of common misconceptions, what about the often stated idea that using virtualization and shared infrastructure in my private cloud reduce complexity, thereby increasing security? So again, not really, um, with the caveat. Unless the virtual machines can be isolated from the virtualization admins, and if there's any, of course there's storage with the virtual machines, any storage they have has been encrypted with a key that's not accessible by any of the storage administrators. So while this might seem to violate what we call law number eight of the old 10 immutable laws of security administration, which for a refresher was the difficulty of defending a network is directly proportional to its complexity, you would think that, well, by reducing this complexity, I've increased security. Unfortunately, though, you still need to follow the tier model. Why is there a violation of the tier model doing these things? So having a private cloud that provides infrastructure as a service to your internal customers is a must in today's data center. However, certain systems like domain controllers do need special care and protection when they are virtualized. What is the issue? So on most virtualization platforms, if you have local administrator or what they call root privileges, it gives you access to all the data that's stored inside those virtual machines. If the virtualization host has a shared storage system that it's leveraging, like a SAN, you, you have another problem, is any account used to administrate the SAN also has access to the data inside those virtual machines. So what makes domain controllers that special? It's just another server. Well, unfortunately, if you have access to the storage of a domain controller, that gives the user access to the Active Directory database. And this is the violation of the credential tier model. If that storage admin, for example, or that virtualization admin, aren't already an enterprise admin. Because anybody with access to that database file could abuse it to take over Active Directory. So again, what should our customers do? So the first option is to use a dedicated virtualization host and storage for your domain controllers or anything else that you deem to be a high value asset that you want to make sure that there's not a large number of unintended people that have access to the system. If shared storage is required, be sure to protect that shared storage using BitLocker, so the key is not something the storage admin can get to, or some other full volume encryption software. So the second option, by the way, is to deploy Windows Server 2016. Uh, for your Hyper-V host. I mentioned local admin earlier, so customers may have been thinking, oh, well, wait a minute, you're meaning Windows Server. But in the new Windows Server, um, we have a technology called Shielded VMs and a new role called the Host Guardian Service. So we encourage our customers to move to 2016 on Hyper-V to take advantage of those technologies. Where can customers find information about all these technologies and how to use them? So again, we have public guidance and we have at the link below, we have an entire walkthrough on how to deploy host guardian service and shielded VMs, which are related on Windows Server 2016. 
And then next is before, Microsoft Enterprise Services can help accelerate your adoption of Host Guardian Service and 2016 with shielded virtual machines with the following offerings. First is we have a deploying Host Guardian Service offering. And then we also have worked to combine that offering uh, with the earlier mentioned offering called the Enhanced Security Administration Environment.